have been programmed by filmmakers that have come into this festival before 2018. So we have this saying, by filmmakers for filmmakers. And what that really means is that uh, those filmmakers decide entirely the program that we have at uh, this year's Sundance. We started in 95 when uh, we didn't get our films into Sundance. Um, none of us. Uh, and then we came together as a artist-led organization that first year to support one another and then we realized there were going to be other filmmakers like us that wanted this showcase. And I think what we've proved over the years is that we can discover great new filmmakers tomorrow. And this is the festival, as some of you saw this weekend, where Anthony and Joe Russo first started. <coughs> and they've just made the biggest budget in film in the history of cinema. So uh, you're in a good place, and it's really great to see you all here today. Um, there are no themes as found out, as I just explained. The filmmakers themselves decided this program, there is no fashion. But if you have a say, one thing about Slam Nuts this year, I think you would use the word humanity. City, Utah, covering the 2018 Slam Dance Film Festival, which we were honored and privileged to be here. We've seen some amazing films and talked to some amazing artists. One thing is for sure, here at Slam Dance 2018, it's always time to go indie now. everybody. It is indeed time to go Indie Now. I'm your host, Joe Compton. Thank you so much for being here, and thank you for liking, sharing, and commenting on this video and every video that we produce, and subscribing to our channel. We really appreciate it. It's awesome to have you here, and it's kind of apropos, as this is our 24th episode of our flagship show, and we just came back from the 24th annual Slam Dance Film Festival. So the numbers kind of aligned, which is kind of neat. This episode, if you didn't gather, is all about the attendees that we met at the Slam Dance Film Festival, all the screening filmmakers and their collaborators. We sat down with quite a few of them and got some great interviews, and you're about to see pretty much most of what we did. Now, I won't talk very long today. We also have all of our usual review segments that we usually have on our show. We also have a bonus interview because it's February. We have an awesome author who has put the science back into love and is going to help you discover, if you need to, that is, how to find love in an easier manner. It's an interesting read regardless, and I think you'd learn a lot about yourself even if you have found love. And it's an interesting study on the dichotomy of men and women. So I thought it would be pretty cool to put it into the February episode, and so I'm doing so. We also have a great, great short film from Sharon Lee who had a film at the Slam Dance Film Festival. That's not this film. This is one of her earlier works. But she graciously agreed to have us be, have it featured here in this episode. It's an awesome short film. She's an incredible filmmaker, and you're going to meet her a little bit later down the road. Uh, we'll talk about that toward the end of our show. So I hope you stick around for that. There's some great interviews, like I said, from Slam Dance, and with that, let's get the show on the road. Here we go, everybody. I'll be back a little bit later. Bye. Ah. 
about authenticity you know it's everything for this series mm -hmm. um, talk about production wise how you structured that how you got that feel that gritty kind of real feel yeah so I think I think probably a big part of that is because almost everyone in the film is a stand-up uh, myself and Kevin Iso who wrote directed and starred in it we're both stand-ups everyone we cast is a stand-up this is my favorite time of the year um, I'm glad that it's getting cold uh, cause, cause I ain't really like the summer at all. Um, that, that's not, that's not the joke, but all right. Um, it's not that I didn't like the weather. The weather was fine, but in the summertime, it's just too many people wearing sandals and, and everybody don't got the feet for sandals. You know what I mean? It's, it's way too many people with regular lives and homeless feet walking around. <laughs> and and uh, I ain't like it. I hate feet. For me, feet are like the first and last piece of bread. Like, <laughs> I know they're there for a reason, but I'm never gonna put them in my mouth, you dig? <laughs> felt comfortable with the actors we were working with and with the script itself that we'd been working on for a while and really wanted to make it feel conversational and organic. And um, we really made uh, strides in, in the edits of the script also even before uh, shooting to uh, really just bring people right into the action right. and not waste the audience's time. That's something you learn in stand-up is how to not waste the audience's time. So I think that uh, helped with it. And then also in the performances to really give uh, the comics we were working with time to really settle into the material and make it better. I think all that helped make it more organic, authentic, hopefully real. Yeah. And, and you work with some known comics and then there's some actors that you hired that aren't really actors. Right. So talk about how you worked with each of those, how, how much differently you approached each of those scenarios. Yeah, so each, um, every adult in it is a comic, some more known than others, but they're all stand-up. So they know their voice to some extent. Tim Green, who plays my stepdad, who's um, a terrific stand-up, um, is very self-assured with who he is, uh, to put it lightly. Uh, Drew Doughty, who's a great comic, he plays the drug dealer, Napoleon Emil, Jeffrey Joseph, who's the principal, who's great. So working with them, we could kind of trust them with the material once they settled into it. Now the kids that we were working with, especially Katora Wright, who plays uh, Zaina in it, she's not uh, an actress at all. I mean, you know, and she's not a comic, so this was her first thing that she was performing in. So the first day, we shot with her for two days. The first day we really wanted to make her uh, feel comfortable. We were a little self-conscious because we had this, it's the climax, this big dramatic scene where there's a lot of 
action potential uh, death going on. And <laughs> we're shooting it with her. This was the first day we'd met her and her uh, mom and brother, like right around the corner in the other room, her little brother. So we were just trying to reassure them in between takes and have, you know, run over and be like, she's doing great. Like she's, you know, just making sure. And then, but the second day we were shooting was in the classroom with her and her around other kids, one of whom was a good friend of hers, that made her, I think, more comfortable and all the kids more comfortable because they were within their age group and they could, f they were in a context that they were familiar with. So in that scene with the kids, we were just kind of letting them talk just to settle in before we shot it. And Nadia Bedzanova, who's our cinematographer, who's wonderful, um, she picked up a lot of that B-roll of just the kids talking. And it was so good and felt so uh, natural and real, like they're talking about like, oh, I'd sleep with their mom. Like, I don't even know what they're saying. Like, it's so funny and genuine that we ended up using that. So we were just letting them go. I'm not even sure how aware they were that they were being filmed at that moment. So it felt really fun to be able to use that there. Yeah. I mean, it's really spectacular. We've never had numbers this low before. Every single one of your students failed. What were you doing? We were, we were bonding. They, they showed that they got the material before we took the test. Really? Yeah. Because, you know, these tests are very important. No, I know. We... Let me just quote. 21X minus 3 equals the 1968 Civil Rights Act. Yeah. We didn't have time to get to math yet. Right. But you've done math, right? Yeah, yeah. So you, okay. So you'll get this right away? Yes. yes. Right. 33G minus 7 equals Coretta Scott King's bust size. They must have looked that one up on their own. We didn't cover that. It's actually correct. Well, that's, that's something. Talking about one of my favorite scenes, the principal scene, yeah. uh, there's an element of humor that layers with this kind of serious uh, tone of where, you know, the action is. And talk about that and how, how important that was for you guys in terms of making this. Was that, was that the catalyst for trying to get this going, or was it more of showing the world as it is? Um, I mean, we're comics, so we wanted to make something funny, but also we wanted to try to show a world that we felt like hadn't been shown. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of a lot of shows, a lot of thing, the characters themselves, even if they're interesting, they live in a very insular world. They go to the diner, they go to the coffee shop, and they just kind of sit there because that's all they, they have no reason to go anywhere, and that gets boring. So putting me as a teacher, him delivering food, it forces us out of our heads, especially as people like dealing with mental health issues also, and bring us out into that environment and giving it this, this sort of grounded unpredictability in a, I mean, ev people show different aspects of New York, but the truth of it is, is that they're all exist and they all overlap yeah. as well. Like everyone's constantly, uh, they have to coexist while doing their own thing. Yeah. So we wanted to show all that. And then the jokes kind of came within that. Like we knew we could make it funny just because that's what we do. We didn't want to force feed jokes. Yeah. We wanted them to come through the characters and the world. Yeah. So how much of this series have you guys produced already? How much more are you going for? And where is it going from here? So the first episode is what's screened at Slamdance here. So the second episode is online now as well. If you go to flatbushmisdemeanors.com, you can see uh, both episodes so far. The second one uh, has some of the same cast. Me, Kevin, uh, Kareem Green is back as my stepdad. And then we have a partner on Sherla, uh, who's wonderful. Yamanika Saunders is one of the funniest comics. She's so great. Um, good she's great. Uh, Carrie Coddett, who's uh, awesome. So we got some really, really great uh, comics as well in that one. And so, and we're starting to film the third third episode now. So our plan was to make three on our own for no budget, and then hopefully we can secure funding because long term we do want to make it a narrative half hour mm -hmm. series. That's the goal. We have the. We know where a season would go and have all that outlined. So that's the next nice. step is just trying to reach more people. Nice. And, and how important is that to have as, as a, somebody who's just starting and trying to make this work and then trying to get it out to other people and have other people fund it? Yeah. Is it do you feel like that's, that was, you had to do that right up from the get-go is make sure you had a whole season outlined? Or was oh, it just yeah. concentrating on the pilot and then working your way through that? I think they're both. I think they're both important because people will look for any excuse to not do something. Right. So if you if you just have here is a thing outlined. People hate reading. That's what I've found. Nobody wants to read anything. You could write a whole script, and no one likes to read words. I think. Maybe. I, hopefully, I'm wrong. But 
So by making it, it was just like to people who were like, I'm not sure I could see it. Like, oh, this is what it is. So this is uh, the world, this is the tone, the pacing, everything. Well, the universe is everything. And if it's expanding, someday it will break apart and that will be the end of everything. What has the universe got to do with it? You're here in Brooklyn. Brooklyn is not expanding. So having that as a calling card, I think, is always super important. And then if you want to go beyond that, I do think it's important to have a thing outlined because to show, like, yeah, we know where this would go. Right. If you trust us to go beyond that, we do have an end game. We're not just going to, like, I don't know, maybe <laughs> there's a twin. I like How much <laughs> money do you have, right? Right, right, right. <laughs> uh, I don't know. So, so I, I, just having all those materials ready, and we've done all this on our own, so yeah. to show, like, this is what we could do with no resources. If you give us resources, it would be better. Right. And we're happy with what we've done so far. I'm excited to keep going. And, and, and you've, you have a co-collaborator who yes. co is everything, basically, yes. directing, writing, yes. producing. Yeah. Talk about that relationship and how you make that work, because that's, yeah. that can be tricky at times, right? Absolutely, yeah. It's very, I mean, yeah, anyone who's collaborated with somebody in any setting, creative or professional, anything, it's tough. But... So Kevin Iso, who's also one of the funniest stand-ups as well, and uh, yeah, just one of my favorite people, is great. And he, you know, it may, is as responsible with all of this. He edits it as well. We go back and forth with the uh, editing, but he really takes the lead on that. And so, you know, I think we have very similar sensibilities, I think, which is important when you're collaborating, but also uh, we're not the same. So we complement each other, I think. Like, I bring ideas or push back on stuff that he wouldn't think of and he does the same for me and I think us finding that middle ground is what led it to this cool uh, spot and so I think that's definitely important when collaborating with somebody there's going to be a lot of trial and error always and there's going to be a lot of um, relationships to become uh, fractured or have highs and lows and I think being able to talk out what the issues are which we've had to do we've always had to have some like just airing conversations when you work with somebody closely that's going to happen but if it works, it works. Yeah. So, yeah, it's exciting, and Kevin's great, and, yeah, he's huge. What do you like about being an indie? You know, you're technically not a filmmaker, but you really, are, you really do put something on a screen. So yeah. uh, what do you like about that uh, process and, and being independent? Yeah, I, lo I love making stuff. I've always wanted to be just a stand-up comedian who makes things. <laughs> so that's, that's the goal, and that's the hope, and the hope is to continue to do that for a bigger audience. So I like doing that because I've, I've worked in, in, like I did an animated pilot for, uh, for Fox. So, so doing that for a network, you go through all these steps and loops and you work over and over. But then ultimately, if it doesn't go to series, no one gets to see it. So, and you have no control over that. So something about doing independently, it's like, okay, well, even if 20 people see this, right. that's something. I'm making something and I'm putting it out there and it's going to reach people who maybe wouldn't know me otherwise. And that's a cool feeling. Yeah. And to not have any restrictions or uh, uh, notes or anything of just like, we're going to go with our gut and see if it has resonance. So that's, that's a great feeling and really exciting to be able to... And to figure out how to do that for scraps, like how to piece all that together, the producing aspect, which is the most exhausting, exhausting <laughs> aspect of it, um, is so fun and so exciting once you see like, oh, we could see this through. We could do, and we could do another one, and we could do a third. So it's like, that, that's adrenaline, and that's super exciting, yeah. Hello everyone, this is Gino Kubo here for Go Indie Now's Indie Film Reviews and today I'm going to start you off with a little bit of an intro.
not coming in my house. Don't mess with that girl. Now, I changed direction. Uh, I'm Alan, and my friend identifies himself as a velociraptor. I shot a burglar and it's dead in your hall. He's, he's yeah, dead. That was just a pal me. Your girlfriend's a prostitute. Well, your girlfriend's a dick. No! No more killing. Why are you burning that name? Dick leave dead bodies. Is this blood? <laughs> oh, your dad's a turtle. Oh, no, he's not. He's a tortoise. Come on, Peter! That is a cucumber. Bang, bang. Let's go! And James Button, if you go to his website, you're going to see that he's been doing this for a while, um, doing kind of these comedies that are a little bit off the cuff, I would say, a little bit crass, but in a good way. And he's got a bit, he's got a, some some awards there for the some of the funniest gore comedies and dark comedies and things like that. Um, I've, I've actually watched quite a few of his films now, and they are really funny. They're short, they're sweet, and they are, I think epitomize the um, small budget filmmakers and I think you can see that he has a recurring cast to keep coming back in different roles and the way that he films his films um, I think really give you a perspective of what you don't really need that much to film a film um, get some friends together and put it together and write a good script and have a good location and you're gonna be able to do it I'm Peter. Oh, God! This is my girlfriend, Jane. And that is a cucumber. Peter! Oh. Are you cheating on me with a vegetable? It's a fruit. It was for our salad. And what makes a good location, um, as you saw there, a kitchen. Um, this comet, the, we'll get to the review of this film in a minute, but um, what you get is a kitchen and you get that as a location, you got yourself a film. Um, the fruit is a cucumber, a vegetable, a fruit. <laughs> um, it certainly is something and what she was using it for is something else. And this is a short romantic comedy. And you're gonna see a lot of um, interesting takes on dating and relationships and what we're supposed to do to handle a relationship and what we do when we find that person that we really want to be with so again it's a fruit 2014 by James Button this is the film that I think you should watch it's on YouTube all the links are gonna be there um, James Button is a funny guy and I think he has some funny material so I hope you enjoy it this is Gino Kubo for Go In D Now you guys have a good one. Uh, I'm here with the Rocksteady family, and um, let's introduce ourselves and tell everybody who you are and what you do. I'm, I'm Trevor Stevens. I'm the director. My name is Bomani Story, and I'm the writer. I'm Heston Horwin. I'm the freshman. I'm uh, Logan Huffman. I play Honor Palmer, the guy who kills people with pencils. Nice. Very nice. So... <laughs> Andrew. Andrew Palmer. Arnold Palmer. I do this all the time. <laughs> No problem, no problem. <laughs>
so I wanted to talk about the tone and the rhythm of the movie. Um, how much of it was pre-written, how much of it was um, done in post-production, and how much was improv So uh, this film was very, very challenging in terms of its tone because like the predecessors that influenced us, Yojimbo and Fistful of Dollars, both those films had, uh, you know, very quick action moments where we were having a lot of fun, but then it went to very dark moments and explored a lot of dark themes. And we were doing something similar with our film. So uh, from the writing room down to post-production, we had a, a big challenge of making sure that, you know, when we go dark, we are able to come back and make people smile or laugh again and, and vice versa. So it was a very, very huge challenge for you know, us. And then Bomani had his hands full in, in the writing room. Yeah, you know, it's like trying to tell, again, you know, we always call this movie like a spaghetti western in a college setting. Um, and obviously the biggest influence that we're wearing on our sleeve, or at least the flashiest are, you know, like you said, Yojimbo and Fistful of Dollars. But um, there was many other influences as I was writing it that were important to me, which was, you know, there's a movie called Battle Royale that has a very fascinating and challenging tone. Um, and there's also another movie that's like people don't really usually consider it to have a challenging tone, but has a very challenging tone. It's called Billy Waters, The Apartment. I um, mean, you're talking about a comedy um, that right smack dab in the middle of it starts becoming a suicide story. And it's just like, and to deal and dig that ditch, you know, and then try to pull yourself out of it sure. is a very challenging thing that I kind of feel like I bit off more than I can chew and I hope <laughs> I pulled it off. <laughs> but like, um, it's a very, um, it's, it's fun to, you know, do that because we want to be challenging filmmakers and we want to do things that haven't been done before and entertain an audience. And there's a certain like, um, beauty to just being, to writing something and um, making a film like that and just being like, accepted or not. You know? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So um, the improv part? Yeah, in terms of improv, uh, for me, the freshman, anything that we wanted to adjust line wise or something that came to me organically on set or whatnot, me and Trevor would always touch base with Bomani. We'd all congregate. Usually it ends with Bomani going, Yeah, dude, totally. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sounds great, man. Yeah, of course. Um, uh, in terms of just doing things on the fly on a, on a take, that was really Logan's specialty. Um, you know, my character is, is much more reserved and he's supposed to be more solid and he's uh, an improv metaphor, the rock among the balloons. Sure. So, uh, you know, a lot of, of my job I felt like was to be more consistent so that this guy can just run wild and do what he does best. Sure. Um, yeah, I got, I got to do, uh, the Sorry. cool thing was is I would check with, I would check with Bo and see if I could keep on going. Uh -huh. And we did, uh, but like, Bomani did like the best writing in some parts where I was like, I just gotta step away and stay back. Like the number two pencil part, where we explained that. It was so cool, it was so well written. I was like, I gotta stay with this, stay with on tune. Um, some stuff I just wanted to add in because like, um, at the very end I say, I say, uh, no, no means no. I wanted to add that in because in order to play a bad guy, you have to be such a degenerate. And there's even worse things I said. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, way worse. Um, and the Tom Brokaw thing, because yeah. I thought, what would piss off a female journalist just to say, you'll never be as good as Tom Brokaw? <laughs> so certain things, I just wanted to get a rise out of people, and they let me play inside that extent. But I always enjoy going off book, and I think it's, I think it's, you can find really rewarding moments. I think in independent films, the biggest thing you need to do is find God moments, where everything syncs up. That's when, like, the sun sets just at the right time. And that's what we're all looking for, because you know, we don't have the budget. We make gold out of nothing. Right. And, uh, and, yeah, we're alchemists. Yeah. But, but... We, when it came to improv, we always checked in, and Bo it was so great. And he let me go crazy, but at the same time, there was things where I like, this is too good. Yeah. I just have to leave it the way it is, you know? <laughs> Which is hard for me, because I'm an asshole when it comes to that. <laughs> but um, no, yeah, it was, it was, it was really good. My, my favorite improvised line of Logan's, can you talk about the bike fair? Oh, when yeah. you guys were leaving? I, I, I wrote a, a script years ago, and um, I put a Douglas MacArthur quote. Uh, we are not retreating, we're advancing in a yeah. different direction. <laughs> and I, I just, uh, you know, I, I, I have to scratch that out of my own script because it's like, well, it played too well, you know? So talk about your process in, in, the, in the way that you guys, do you guys start with the external? Is it, is it in, do you go from external to internal? Do you guys look for the voice first? How do you find your character to, to begin with? Um, well, that's, that's, that's a, a big thing. I mean, yeah. it, it can be something as subtle as, you know, the way you put your hair. Yeah. Uh, but I think, I, I, I'm in the belief that the number one thing you do is find out like what, what scares this person, 
what makes this person happy, and then find that deep part of you. But number one, stay focused on the other actors and let their influences push you inside this direction. Um, I think I think always trust your instincts. Don't think at all. No, read your lines a thousand times before you say them, so you know it like the back of your hand. Because how we're talking right now is completely subconscious. And if you put a camera on it, it would be fucking beautiful. Because we don't care. Yeah, yeah. We're just we're just existing. Yeah. And that's what you have to get at. So I think the biggest thing actors need to do is not be lazy. Read the script a thousand times. Read the lines a thousand times. And then let it roll off like a sneeze. Yeah. Because the funnest stuff is the sneeze. It's the God moments. If you're not thinking, you can find God. You know, that's that's what you should do. I don't know, that's what I think. This guy's awesome, man. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I had this guy saying things like this every single day on set. I was just learning everything as much as I could, just writing notes from this dude. Um, in terms of building the character, for me and with Trevor and Bomani, I was just watching a lot of film of various things across the board. Um, last night, so I mentioned as far as my character's movement and his yeah. combat, we studied Bruce Lee a lot, and specifically his fight with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and the comedy and the humor that's implemented in such a smooth, cool-looking fight is such a cool juxtaposition, and informing my character further than just the movement was also the attitude and style of a character called Spike in an uh, anime called Cowboy Bebop, nice. which we watched a lot and studied a lot. And so... I suppose it starts external with all of this content that I just try to absorb and I watch and watch and study over and over and over again. And then I start internalizing it. And then I start developing my, my life story as this character and what he wants and, and everything like that. So yeah, I definitely start externally and built it to an internal. In, in terms of the process too, you guys talked about music being a big influence on all of you. So talk about that a little bit and how, how music this is set the tone for you guys. Well, from the get-go, I mean, we, we started in the writing room listening to Devo, uh, The Warriors. Uh, the score of The Warriors actually was a huge, huge reference. Yeah, we nice. watched the beginning of The Warriors, you know. And yeah. the society. Boom, 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 some of the shots boom, boom. in the society. Yes, exactly, nice. exactly. Um, and then that was kind of the original thing. And then when I sat down with the Josh, our composer, we were looking at all this and trying to make sense of all of it, of course, because I was giving a lot of funky references. Sure. And what happened was it all came back down to character. You know, like Logan was saying, like everything always comes back down to character. Uh, and so with the society, you know, they're all waltz, right? You know, because yeah. they're all very uppity, you know, and they're all very organized. <laughs> so they had a very, you know, box structure score. Uh, whereas with Palmer, it's more of just sounds. There's no, there's no rhyme or reason or rhythm. It's just like a tss, tss, And something about it is so unsettling. And so you, when you hear it, you know on screen that he is coming and you do not feel right. Oh, hi, I'm Andrew Palmer with Rocksteady University. And I want to welcome you wonderful parents and these beautiful new freshmen to our amazing school. A school that kids are dying to get into. A place where your kids can learn a higher education. Safety is our highest priority. Your children are going to find friends. Friends that last a lifetime. What's got you waiting? Join us at Rocksteady University. And don't forget, bring your bike. I, I tried to find a, a song for each character. Yeah. And I played on repeat throughout the duration. That's right before the day starts. Have, have a good cup of it and then let it go. And then if, if things start to taper off, have a good cup of it. Tell everybody the, the album that you, you were touching. Black and white, Michael Jackson. Because <laughs> there was something like... Yeah. The, Michael Jackson has a slightly homoerotic attractive thing. I feel like the male frat environment is such a homoerotic... But also there would have to be that glamour yeah. of that time period where, yeah. where, where we were. But, you know, I, I encourage every actor, go find your music, what your character listens to. Oh. Mm -hmm. so, I just listen to a lot of Devo. Nice. It's pretty straightforward. It's a lot of diva. Uh, can you talk about the animation portion of the film? How it came about? When did you decide to um, put that in there? And uh, how much how much that was a part of this film? So, um, our, one of our storyboard artists, uh, Lisa, actually was our animator for the whole thing. Her name was oh, Lisa nice. Wu. She was amazing for this whole process. Um, 
And when we were first talking about it, we originally uh, were just going to have the very beginning kind of a schoolhouse rock type of intro into the school, like Welcome to Rock City University. Um, but as we were laying things out, you know, we knew that we had a very complex setting and a story to tell here. And we knew that like, if people don't understand where they are in the first five minutes, we could lose them. You know, we want this to be fun. We want there to be mystery. You know, yeah, but we need people to understand. Hey, this is college, but not the way you've ever seen it before. And so, really, the only way we could do that right away was to do it in this way that way, you know, we're, we're telling a fable. Mm -hmm. And we want to have that fable approach. And so, that's exactly what we took. We took like, the idea of, like, you know, the hand style of, like, an old, of an old fable, an old fairy tale, you know, like uh, my own Mother Grimm, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And so, we took that, and then we referenced, like, the idea of, like, kind of mixing with a little bit of the schoolhouse rock, and we kind of infused those. So, it gave nice. a little bit of this weird kind of retro 70s college vibe. Uh, like they want to get that peachy feel, you yeah. know? And so we, we subtracted some of the colors and then saturated the others. Uh, and color being a huge part of this film as it is because we want the idea that if you see red, Kappa's, blue society, yeah. and having you know the freshman right there in the neutral zone along with Piper. How, many, how, many, how much rewriting did you do on set? Was there any? Um, on set was there, there, well, there was. Uh, I was just going to mention. That. I'm glad you asked that because mm -hmm. what I was going to say about Bomani is, I mean, again, you said the Rock City family. Mm -hmm. um, we were mentioning this last night, down to the actors, everyone was picking stuff up and running. Yeah. There's not a single soul that wasn't putting on multiple hats. And the great thing about Bomani is that like, he wasn't like he just hand out the script and ran. You know, he was there every day of production. He also was our DIT. Um, <laughs> and even after when we went to post, you know, as we're looking at this, like I would look over cuts with Bomani and we look at it and um, and we would do rewrites for either ADR or even the narration and we would, you know, keep honing in. And so he never left, you know, we were working on this, you know, uh, all the way through to the very end. Mm -hmm. To like the last days of you know sound mixing, we were just like, oh, this line, you know, to make sure that it was all there. So um, his job as a writer did not end uh, off the white page. You know, it, it ended on the silver screen. Nice. Um, and that's what was so great about our collaboration. Uh, nice. That's always the way it's been. I mean, it's always the way it worked because we don't we don't ever go in. Oh, like here's what you get, and that's it. Like we, you know, we go in to finish. You know, we go in all hands in. Yeah. We always want to go 110 percent. You know, because. Mm -hmm. Um, there's nothing worse than just being like, well, it's good enough, and then walking mm -hmm. away. Yeah. It's, you know, it's never good enough. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I love when these guys improv, because um, <laughs> even though it's like, yeah, I spend a lot of hours, a lot of time, you know, trying to nail lines and get lines and like write the structure and all this stuff. But at the end of the day, I feel like my job is like, after I do that, I want you to make it better. I want you, whatever I gave you to stand on, I want you to jump higher. Nice. I don't want you to just be like, oh, here it is, and here's what it is. You know, mm -hmm. it's just like, that doesn't do anything for me. Mm -hmm. It doesn't do anything for him, and it doesn't do anything for you. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just like, that's why I loved, like, all his improvisation that he was doing. Yeah. You know, it's like it really brought the character to life, mm -hmm. you know? And it was just like, he really, to me, that's him looking at it and seeing past the lines, mm -hmm. you know? And reading in between the lines, and he the it. You know, it's just like, doing, like, you know, him smiling and doing all this stuff for the combat and doing his thing, like, it just brings it to life, and I feel like that's what you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And as the director, he does the same thing. You know, it's just like with Sergio Leone. You know, I doubt he wrote "hang" on a close-up of their face while they're doing it. Yeah, you know, for right. Hours, you know. <laughs> it's like that's them looking at the script, going in between the lines, and making it better. You know, to me, it's just like, and when you do that, and we're all working together because it is a very collaborative, artistic process mm -hmm. um, with a lot of ego involved and stuff like that. Come together, I mean, we all look better, like, yeah, right. <laughs> what do you want, you know? Nice. Well, I, was, I mean, like, it, there's no doubt, like, this, this whole process, um, this whole process, I think everyone would agree is like a tennis match, you know, like, this is no single person. What happens is that, like, someone throws out like a creative idea and like hits it hard and bounces it across the other person, you know, whether it was in the writing room to when we we're on set, you know, with the actors and the crew members, everyone was involved in throwing it back and forth. And what that does is it just creates this crazy rhythm mm -hmm. and crazy kinetic energy that like brings something brand new. So, you know, I never, none of us ever felt that, you know, if, if we had to subtract something, if we had to you know, take something out of the cut, if we had to change a word here, do whatever. It was never about like, well, this is what I want. It was about like what feels best. And we all knew it. You know what I mean? That was cool. Like we all, we were able to trust our gut instincts. And like when we felt it, we were like, all right, this is, this is right. Uh, what does it say on your own personal cassette as you put it into your personal Walkman? <laughs> what is the title? What, what is the title? Because uh -huh. mm -hmm. that's a real important part of this film. Yeah. Yeah. Go. Oh. Nice. Mine will probably read, kick your own ass. <laughs> uh, People that needs to be taught. Mmm, nice. Furious passion.
Greetings fellow humans and welcome to another uh, indie music review with your friendly host or co-host or side host or something, JD Estrada. If you hear some acoustic music actually playing uh, video game music, that's because I have uh, Super Guitar Bros playing. Um, I wanted to take some of the recommendations that I then that I was gonna give and do something a bit different uh, how often do you hear music that is video game music played on acoustic guitars the first recommendation I gave uh, for the last episode was lowercase uh, noises which is instrumental music these aren't your typical indie bands when you come to think of it but this Detroit, Michigan band is very much an indie band and a lot of fun. It's actually, for me, great music uh, to write to and they're on Bandcamp. That's how I fi actually find a lot of the indie bands that I support. Um, just great music to write to, to be chill to, to have fun to. Um, they play music from, this is actually from Chrono Trigger from Super Nintendo. But you can also have Ninja Gaiden from the original Nintendo. Let's put it on. You can also have Zelda Ocarina of Time. Basically, if you've played any of these games and you listen to this, you go like, oh, that's extremely familiar, but new. And that's what I like about acoustic music or orchestral arrangements of uh, video game music. It's just a different approach to something that you know. And that's why I think it's such good writing music. Since it's familiar, uh, it's comforting. And at the same time, since it's acoustic, um, I don't know, it's got a nice groove to it. So by all means, uh, go check these guys out. They're from Detroit, Michigan. They got two albums out. The first one is Super Guitar Bros. The second one is Nice. Um, you can see their videos actually playing these songs on YouTube. And I'll actually include the link to their band camp. So by all means, enjoy. Until next time, rock on. Fendelman and I directed the film. My name is James Chase Sanchez and I'm a producer on the film. Nice. So talk about how you came across the subject, uh, why it became so important to make this movie. Yeah, I came across actually a mutual friend connected me with Chase and he told me about the story of this man who self-immolated years back and to bring attention to racism and that immediately grabbed me mm -hmm. in this man who gave such a sacrifice in such a horrific way to a cause that wasn't even his own cause and kind of made me reflect on my own life on how I you know how much I'm not doing and how much I need to be doing. I just wanted to know more about his life and, and story. And you found a bunch of articles and stuff, right? That, that, or there was a book or something, that, that like source material that you found that brought this whole thing to light? Yeah, so I, I'm from Grand Saline. I, I grew up in this town. And, wow, um, really? Yeah, wow. yeah. So I, when I heard about it, immediately I started doing research. And this became my... Uh, dissertation project. So I wrote sort of a, a small book and I will eventually write a, another book on it. 911. Um, this is Angie at the uh, Dollar General in what uh, city? At Grant Saline and the man's on fire out in the parking lot. The man is on fire? Yes, the man just set himself on fire. 103, we have a 322 at the Dollar General parking lot. It was about five, I think, between four and five, somewhere in there. 
he was just like pacing back and forth. We were like, what is like, what is he doing? Like, that's weird. But he was so far out. I was like, maybe he's like picking weeds or, you know, something. Oh, I remember him in school, all the way through school. And, you know, I don't, I don't want to say anything about the man, but he was, I was really, really surprised when I heard what had happened. I don't know, people just, sometimes they get off over in the left field. I had seen the car that I'd seen him walk from, and there was a uh, high school diploma and then a note. It said something about he was tired of seeing the blacks treated like they was through the years in Grand Saline, Texas. Like, why suicide? Why was that? being a minister, the best option. So you mentioned in the guidebook that you guys had, you had a couple challenges with the townsfolk. Talk about that and, and how did you overcome that? We went to, we went up to Grand Saline about seven times oh. on the trip and I think for the most part people were, were pretty we're pretty, uh, you know, embracing and, and open, and, and and people who wanted to talk did, and people who didn't talk, who didn't want to talk, did not talk to us. <laughs> and but there was a time by the end where I think uh, people started to get a little more tense about us filming, and yeah. we filmed some public events, and that was, I guess, the, the straw that broke the camel's back as far as, hey, what are these guys doing here? And they started being more outlandish and public about. The criticism of what we were doing. Oh. Yeah, and, and to add to that, you know, we, we started hearing towards one of our last visits um, that people were, you know, there were a lot of conversations from higher ups in Grand Saline about us and our project and whether people should interview with us or not. And so, um, especially on our, our last trip there, uh, it was really hard to get interviews because some people were hearing that they shouldn't talk to us and, and so forth. Uh, because of these conversations. And I remember, like, the police chief of Grand Saline added me on Facebook, like, and I felt like it was, like, so he could track what I was doing. And then after we left, he deleted me off Facebook. So uh, it was something, it was sort of towards the end, it, it got wow. pretty weird, yeah. As artists, we see our work on the big screen, and we, uh, we often, our, our biggest critics, we notice the little things, and maybe I should have cut here, or I'd done something differently. But I want to know from you, what did you look at and you saw and you said, oh, I nailed that? I really, I really appreciate in the film when we get into the, the retelling of the, uh, the self immolation Act. Mm -hmm. And there is a, a movement in the film. There's a, a feeling and a tone. <clears throat> there's definitely building up. And it's, it's, built, it's connected with emotion. And the visuals, I thought, that our cinematographer did were just right on and just it felt like in a just in a cinematic way nice. things all came together and I just feel like great the music it just it's hitting it and I, and I would say uh, I think my favorite aspect that, that shows up in the film is really a lot of the b-roll of Grand Saline the slow-mo shots through the some of the alleys of the streets and because to me it sort of parallels you know tr the, the story we're telling about Charles Moore and Grand Saline you have these these sort of empty streets this old town where you knew that these buildings in the 1920s and 30s, there were businesses and now most of them are just decaying. And it really just sort of tells the story of, of this sort of older Grand Saline that you know have the older um, viewpoints that are often coming up in, the, in these interviews. And so I think those shots are really, to me, beautiful. And, and Jill did a great job with them. And they're very, um, um, I think they sort of uh, are, um, thematic and, and really what we're trying to build and telling the story of, of Charles. Yeah, on that, on that, along those lines, talking about that, the film looks very much like a narrative in terms of the look of it, the framing, the, the frame rate, and everything about that. Did you do a lot of pre-production and setup 
for, for that? Was that your goal, was to try to make it more, look like more of a narrative? And do you think that, is that something that documentaries are missing? Yeah, so documentary, at least traditionally we think of documentary and the aesthetic, which I think is changing now for sure, but can be much less the, the priority, it's more about the content. Yeah. And in making this film, uh, I, really, I really wanted to have a very a language that was very developed from the beginning. Mm -hmm. I knew when, when Chase and I jumped into it, we didn't know exactly what we were gonna be capturing. We did, like it was still very kind of blurry, but we knew we were just gonna go start doing it. Mm -hmm. And we're just gonna film a lot of people, and we're gonna get a lot of content, and then we're gonna develop the story as we go. So within that, I wanted to have a, a very clear-cut, simple, deliberate language aesthetic that then once that's established, we can all, we can all just get all the content. And so as long as it's in that language, it's gonna have a uniformity to it. Mm -hmm. And that involved, okay, it's gonna be a heavy interview film. What lens are we gonna use for the interviews? How are we gonna frame them? What's the composition gonna be? And we're gonna do that same thing for the whole film. Uh, B-roll wise, okay, we're gonna put it on a steady cam and we're gonna do slow motion B-roll and all the B-roll is gonna be at 60 frames and it's gonna be slow-mo and it's gonna be in the same vibe. Nice. And from the stat, and then we knew down the road we would do reenactments and that would have its own aesthetic that would contrast that. You've done narratives and documentaries. At what point when you get a subject and you get something that you're passionate about, do you decide which way to go? I mean, for, I, it's usually pretty clear cut in approaching a film, whether it's going to be a doc or, or narrative mm -hmm. film. So I, I feel like in approaching it, I already have the, the right lens on. Mm -hmm. Now, some of my fiction films have very doc-like aesthetics or uh, approaches using lots of non-actors, mm -hmm. uh, reaching real locations, things like that. Yeah. But I guess at the end of the day, you are falling into non-fiction or fiction, and there's certain whether it's guidelines, approaches, or even freedoms that come with that. Was there ever a discussion amongst the both of you whether to turn this into a narrative? Or was it always going to be a documentary in your mind? Yeah, uh, yeah I think we, we knew it was going to be a documentary. And, and I think just because we were both so moved from Charles Moore that, and, and understanding the town that we knew we really wanted to capture the slice of reality and be able to, to share it with other people. So, I mean, you have had film f festival success not only with this film, but other films in the past. So, tell me one tip you have for submitting to film festivals. Do you have certain, something that you look for? Is there, is it, is it selective process? How do you approach the film festival process? Okay, so a couple of things just in the pragmatic element of a submitting to film festivals that I do now is one, I submit as early as possible. Nice. Two, if I have any sort of connection in any way, I try to leverage that connection. I don't think it gets you into the festival, but I think it maybe gets you seen, yeah. it gets you a better chance of being seen by the right person. So as early as possible, I try to, or try to get a waiver is good too. Yes. Um, and those, I mean, that's sort of just one little thing I just learned. Just get there early, you don't want to be at the end of the day. You get either a cheaper fee or you get a waiver fee. You get make sure you're not in the scramble at the very end. And then you submit the festivals that make sense, yeah. that, that maybe have a relevant topic that you think your festival, your film probably fits into, you know, things like that. So what did Charles Moore teach you that no other documentary subject has taught you so far? Yeah, I mean, Charles Moore, it's interesting to make a film about someone who's, who's died. Right. And who died in such a manner. Yeah. And that was something that was going through my head, I think both Chase and I, and the whole process about in a way, I was thinking like he was looking down on us. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I was always questioning myself in the process of making it. Is this something, if Charles was there looking down upon us, how would he feel about this? Are we staying true to ourselves and to um, the best of our ability, his message of what he was trying to do and explore and things he was trying to question? So that process in itself was something that was... Um, very affecting to me. Mm -hmm. nice. Yeah, and, and I think something, you know, when I started doing this project, even before Joe and I got together, you know, I, I just thought of it as like, this was a protest, he sacrificed himself, even though what he did, like, I know it had to hurt people, it was good. And, and I don't want to take away and say that what he did was bad, but 
the more we did the, pr the process of interviewing friends and family especially, the more I realized how much pain there was from his death that as someone who just saw him as an outsider, you know, who, who didn't know him, it didn't affect me as much as it affected, you know, people who, who really cared and loved, loved him. And, you know, seeing that just made me realize how complex, you know, something like this protest really is, that it can't just be, like, totally good or totally bad. It's, you know, it's, it's complex. There's people and there's a wide array of emotions with, with this sort of complicated subject. So. Charles Moore was standing here. What would you say to him right now? Ooh, yeah. I'll let Chase take the first one. Oh, man. You, know, you really know what I would do is I'd give him a hug. And I would tell him that um, I, I don't think I'll ever fully understand everything that made him choose his self-immolation. I feel like our film and my research, I, I have a grasp of it, but I don't know everything about it. But I'd let him know that what he did impacted my life. And I will, I will always remember and reflect on what he did until the day I die. And I think that that powerful um, act is something that I and so many other people have been affected by. And I would just let him know that, um, that he did create change. He affected people with his, with his last act. And so I would let him know that um, in some ways he, he got what he wanted. And hopefully this film is an extension of that for him. Yes. And that I would, I would hope, I would ask for his blessing in that. Did the family, did the family have anything to say to you guys about the film? Yeah, I mean, we filmed them. They're in the film, and uh, the ones that have seen the film have been very complimentary of it, and, nice. and especially the son guy. Mm -hmm. I'm in touch with now and then, and uh, he's, he's, he's in some way taking the flame from Charles and wants to use the film and get out there and just oh, like cool. continue the the, That's the, the really vision. camera you got like three people and you got to shoot and you got to just do it now and it's got to get done so you know I learned that discipline of you know of like just yeah, speed mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know the better word for speed but I can't uh, maybe 10,000 hours but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly so I think um, I think I just learned how to move move quicker on set and not like and, not, and, and work a lot in prep so that on set we can be as efficient as possible uh, because on these you know budgets and schedules and everything you just don't have time to to ponder on set, you have to move, you have to go. Right. So I think that that's the biggest thing. And you mentioned in the press notes that um, how this was a meditation on forgiveness. Can can we forgive the ones who hurt us the most? So 
do you feel like making this movie has helped you answer that question, or do you, did it create more questions for you? Well, I think good we're all, yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, I think I think we're all working through things, you know, mm -hmm. with whether it's family or friends or you know someone who's wronged you or you know the barista that looks like they maybe spit your coffee, like you know it could be it could be anything. And it's like, how do you deal with them? But I I find that you know people people more often than not are not out to get you. Yeah, people are not trying to hurt you deliberately. I think it's more accidental, and I think people come up with all these conspiracy theories of, you know, this person's trying to destroy my life. It's like, so not the case. Like, they're just all up in their business. And they're not thinking about you. Right. And you're just like the aftermath. What, what attribute or experience on this set that, that you haven't had before that you appreciated the most in, in doing this movie? Well, one thing I always appreciate, not, not that I haven't had it before, because um, a crew with I work with, most frequently is, is like a family, but walking on and being a new member mm -hmm. of a family, which I haven't been able to do in a long time, was um, really quite, um, not only beautiful, but like easy. And um, just like coming into your like little family that you guys have built, that's uh, the family you could have chosen was, we've said it today and we'll say it again, it, it was the best part, the best surprise, and the best part. Part of the family. You are, I know. But once you're in one, I'm adopted. <laughs> what are you ladies going to miss most about your character? Oh, God. Oh. Her strength. Yeah. That's yeah. good, yeah. I especially appreciated that about her. Yeah. yeah it's really... I'm going to miss Nick's strength. I mean, <laughs> I mean, we all need a little bit of that. I think Kim was so, I mean, she's so damaged and, and maybe not even damaged is where I. She's such a, she's, she is still a conundrum to me, I and mean, she's still confusing to me. Um, You're so full, you, there's yeah, so there's much. Just, like, like, and she's like, yeah. a, she's like a bunch of burning strings, and like, she can't put the fire out, you know? And it's sort of just like, but I will, I will say, I don't let things go easily, maybe she, and she lets things go way too easy, so maybe I'm in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of want to know from you guys, your process, do you start with the external or the internal? How do you guys work your characters through when you start to, before you get on set and everything? Yeah, um, I always start with the internal, um, and then but I love the external stuff. That's like the cherry on top when you get close to shooting, and you're you know you you know meet with the team, and you come up with the haircut you want to do, and you figure out the clothes you put on the shoes or no shoes, or that all informs it and kind of sinks you into it once mm -hmm. you're there, um, and that solidifies it. But I the think glasses you have in particular to, for you, the I glasses, thought, was yeah, a, was a really real confidence cool. no, I forgot Yeah, that. I know. <laughs> Um, so yeah, all the little things add up, and um, and then yeah, that gives you kind of the freedom to then play, and you do the sure. homework beforehand so that yeah. you can let it go and have fun, and yeah. And the ex I mean, that type of external is always like, like you said, the tray on top is like the glass. Yeah. You're just sort of like spray yeah. painting it. But I mean, the words are. I mean, that's where the whole yeah. character is. I mean, and I don't even know if that's really external. It's yeah. on the page as an actor, but it's your voice is the character. So kind of meets in the middle there too. Um, I had an acting coach that I always used to say, just because the writer wrote it doesn't mean you get to say it, which sort of means oh. you, you only get to say it if you really know where it's coming from. Yeah. Um, which I feel like everything you wrote was super authentic. And, um, you kind of just like, you either have to accept where it's coming from or you're going to run away. Yeah. Well, you have so much like intelligence and wit about you that like, you can see that in your eyes, like even when you're not talking, like you're thinking, you're processing, like we're interested in like what's going on in your head, and it's like she's keeping all this like so tight. I think that's why your performance is so powerful to people because they're, you know, that's like coming through your eyes without so many lines that nobody ever heard. Yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> so much going on. They're making up their own backstory. Of what's going on? It's fair. <laughs> <laughs> what has been the response from the uh, LGBT? community and uh, have anything surprised you and what they responded to? Yeah, you know, I, I think we've had a warm response, you know, we just premiered today, so yeah. it's... Yeah. <laughs> so oh, is this the first time it's ever been seen anywhere? Ago, yeah. Wow, yeah. okay. Yeah. But, um, but I did speak to a, a very nice reporter from the Philadelphia Gate News, and, and we were talking about the film and, and how it surprised her and, and how, you know, the, it's a very sensitive thing about you know, being bisexual yeah. and having a character that kind of swings in different directions. and there have been depictions of those types of characters, and they're kind of, not demonized, but they, they, they definitely don't get as fair a shake within that community as, mm -hmm. as some of the other um, groups. And so, uh, you know, but she was, we were talking about how the movie wasn't about her, it wasn't about that, it was about this person 
who is struggling to figure out who she is. It's not, it really is not about you know, how she identifies herself. And I think that's really important. Um, I think it's, you know, there's so many lost people that are like trying to figure it out because when you grow up, there's so much that you're told who you are by your parents and all the things that you, you know, you've been told how to live. And then you get that out on your own and there's this weird period where you're just, you're floating <laughs> and you're trying to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And maybe, you, you know, everything that you know, maybe that's all a lie. Maybe it's all this other thing that you really like. So it, 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 people are very complex and messy and, you know, I think people are still figuring it out to the very last day. Uh, what do you guys cherish most about being an indie, in, in indie film? What do you like about it? I like how every single person is a collaborator. Because, I mean, you, you'd think that'd be the case. Yeah. Um, my experience is mostly as being an actor and sometimes you're put in like a room with padded walls. <laughs> yeah. It's like, it's sort of like, just going to the bathroom now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh. And like, I, you know, if something needs to be moved on set, everyone gets in to move something on set. And, and, you know, like we said earlier today, like, the idea is to get the film done as best as possible because mm -hmm. you're all there for the same reason as you think everyone would be, but I think in any job that you do, as far as I've heard, you know, it's not always the case. And hopefully, I mean, I think we had a really special experience, but I mean, hopefully, the indie film that you're doing and hopefully the film that you're doing um, is like this, but life isn't always like that, as we can tell by watching the film. Life yeah. isn't always what you picture it to be. Yeah, that's really about that community, mm -hmm. you know, that tribe of people that you like build everything around. And, you know, it's, it's the crew, it's the cast, it's you know, it's kind of having that like shorthand. Mm -hmm. you know? I think that goes a long way. And the movies that I like the best that are like huge scale, bigger budget, big TV shows. It's like when you feel like they're all a family too, and they're all right. they're doing that same mentality. It's just on a, the scale is bigger. True. So I think you can still maintain that no matter what the size of you know, the project or the shoot days you have. Sure. I like that mentality. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, as a filmmaker, you go on, you see it on the big screen, and you can see probably a million things that you would probably want to do differently, or <laughs> yeah. change, or yeah. figure out, or go, oh man, I missed that. Yeah. And you probably see the movie a hundred times over. But I want to know from you. Five hundred times. Yeah. Yeah. I want. I want to know from you not what you saw that was bad. I want to know from you what you thought you nailed. Oh wow. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, I'm not going to sound uh, egotistical Mr. here. Mr. Humble right? has to <laughs> sum it up, couldn't okay. if you tried. <laughs> uh, well, I know, well, it's funny because like... Do you want us to tell you what you're No, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not fishing, I'm not fishing, guys. No, but, um, you know, it's funny because when we found out we got Miss Land Dance, something clicked in my head and was like, I need to change some stuff. <laughs> like, so I went back in and I like cut some things a little tighter and, you know, put some cards up and, and I just, you know, there were some, certain things that were like bubbling, but then once I knew it was going to be and show. I was like, okay, now it's you know, now I gotta really you know cinch it. Mm -hmm. So that was um, that was something that I was I was proud that I knew to do that as opposed to know later and be like, ah, oh, I should have done that Watch thing. Sure. Now, it's never too late to make changes, as George Lucas has shown us. <laughs> I think he's still editing a Star Wars yeah, movie it's somewhere. It's already airing. He's got he's got a it's got super super paper cut. Yeah. All the fans out there. Yeah, I think it's super paper cut. Yeah. And this is the first time we used a zoom lens. I'd never really used a zoom lens to, uh -huh. to shoot scenes. And that uh -huh. was like a personal, like, you know, I've never done it, but I'm going to try it and see if I can do a scene in like one shot that's a, a slow zoom, kind of like Robert Altman used mm -hmm. to do. And it's like, those are some of my favorite scenes where you have six characters, they're all talking over each other with overlapping dialogue, and the camera's just kind of wandering and finding them. And so that was really like a big experimental thing, because we didn't get other coverage. It was like, this is what we got. Mm -hmm. And I was really, I was so happy with the results because I felt like the performances were more organic. Because sometimes when you're on set and everyone has to like wait their turn, right. it just feels, I don't know, a little stilted. Well, just, yeah, but when everyone can kind of talk over it, that's what real life is. Yeah. Like, yeah. You're at a restaurant, like, you know, there's like six things. Like, we're here and then it's half here and then over here a little bit and yeah. drunk guy barfs over there. And yeah. <laughs> that's it all interesting. It's just sitting there going, why am I here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what advice would you all have? I want to know from each of you. Um, for, for inexperienced um, actors or directors, what, what's one thing that you would tell them that you wish you had been told? Ooh. I would say just keep at it, like keep yeah. doing it. I think the, like I went to film school and I started making movies like over the summer. I made my first feature the summer after my sophomore year. I was like, you have to just do this. You have to learn. You have to grow with your community and you have to vlog your hours. And I think just doing it and find the people in your community and near you and don't try and yeah work with people that it might take five years to get a hold of them or whatever just go do it um 
and you're just going to keep getting better and just keep growing and yeah, just stay at it. <laughs> I think like a really a luxury that we have, which you didn't realize on the other side because you just don't like you really you don't appreciate it when you're a waitress or you know personal fitness or at the gym or you know a barista like you don't appreciate that if this is your dream wherever you are it's kind of what you should be doing mm -hmm. because the only thing you should be doing is talking to people and watching people and listening because all you should be doing all day long is absorbing stories and if you're not and and and, and go watch everything and read everything but if you're not in the real world and you're not you know talking to people and strangers that you don't know then how are you ever going to be able to understand a character that you portray on the page. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, I, w I grew up reading all these film books of like how other people did it. Yeah. And, but the funny is as soon as they're written, it's a totally different way about yeah. to get in. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, the old like, oh, you know, you pop your movie um, in the mail and you send it to somebody and uh, you get an agent and yeah. now you're, you're getting millions room, of right? dollars and they're remaking your $8,000 movie into a $20 million movie and it's like all the phone calls won't stop ringing. That doesn't really happen. You're like, where do I get a VHS? <laughs> yeah, that happened, That's how I start. <laughs> that happened to like two people in the 90s, yeah. maybe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then since it's like, it evolves like constantly. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's just, you know, you know, look at what, it, what what you have in your immediate surroundings, you know, the people around you, but also the equipment. Like, you don't need the fanciest cameras. You don't need the craziest lens. You don't need the most, like, you know, highest on the star meter IMDb people. Like, you don't, that is not necessary <laughs> to make and tell a good story. No. Um, yeah. What you need is you need truth and you need to just, um, you need to just go do it and put it out there. And you're going to get better because the more you work it, the, I think you learn each time out. And you know, in film school offers that that you can kind of do it in private. And I sort of did it in public. I was like learning in public with all my like yeah. short films and sketches and things, for better or worse. But, uh, some people. but anyway, that I think is just you know get as much experience as you can because ultimately, like you know, if you want to keep going and keep making stuff, that's that's the only way. That's how like I feel like I've heard Martin Scorsese say each time making a movie, it's like take your hat out, ask yeah. for money. Like he still has to go around. He's like Martin Scorsese. Yeah. One of the greatest filmmakers ever, and he's like schlepping around, <laughs> hustling, busking on the side of the road. He's busking. He's never seen him on Hollywood and Vine. That's how he's funny to the party. Yeah, there is a common misconception of like, oh, as soon as they get an agent, as soon as they get a manager, right. like I'm of course, set, yeah, it's good, right? It doesn't but it happen. Never, that yeah, long. no, it always has always has to come from you. You have to be the driver of whatever you want to do. So you, and you like, basically put it, just, whatever you put into it, you get out. Absolutely, yeah. that never goes away from like. Student films to Scorsese. And you just have to work really hard. Yeah. Like yeah. so many people yeah. want the shortcut, there's no shortcut. You have yeah, to work so good. hard and yeah. you just it's like it has to be your everything. If yeah. it's not, then maybe it's not for you. Because yeah. you have to give it your everything. If you don't, probably it's probably not gonna happen. But yeah. if you give it everything, you work it and you love it, like that's gonna come through and people are gonna see that. I, that's what I believe. Yeah. Hello, JB Taylor here with an audiobook review. This time around, I am reviewing Bay's End by Edward Lorne. This is a story about two kids who play a trick on a police officer. Trey and Eddie are their names, and uh, Trey is telling the story. It really just takes place over a summer. There's this police officer, Officer Mac. And he's just a douche nozzle. Eddie, who is new in town and is, you know, as kids will do, you know, you, you know, you move in next door and oh, there's a kid next door and I'll introduce myself and your best friends. You know, that's what kids do. Eddie's a bit of a wild card. He's, you know, different. And, um, well... They sneak out one night and um, 
they want to go to this location that is for kids scary um it's off limits you know it's abandoned and all that not supposed to go there well matt catches him and he you know gives him a hard time and uh later on to get back at officer mac they see him you know he's, he's pulling someone over and so they they want to get back at him and so eddie um talks him and actually another character um into um, putting cherry bombs in officer max uh police car while he's doing his his job it goes off they go running and that's that's really where things get crazy there is dark dark content in this this uh story um it's all expertly done it's all um written with a purpose um written with expertise it's n none of it is for shock value um but there are um deeds of pedophilia mental abuse mild sexual situations dark and disturbing but it's real it's it's very genuine it speaks of innocence lost nostalgia having to grow up fast i just loved how uh edward Horn wrote this story it's, it's very tense but it's so nostalgic i love the Sega Genesis and Sonic the Hedgehog and Mortal Kombat and Wayne's World was mentioned and I love the the um, Bachman High um, as, which is a shout out to Stephen King um, it has all this nostalgia and all this innocence and charm weaved into this dark very morbid tale and it all made for a powerful gut punch um, typically, I don't like when stories get dark like this, but the way it was done, it was, he, he couldn't have crafted the story any better than he did. Um, so that was good. As for the narrator, uh, Kerry Woodrow, um, he's an older man, which you'll see makes sense, um, considering Terry is an older individual when he's telling you this story. Um, but for an older man who has to voice children, um, he does a really, really good job. Um, the only voice I, I didn't like, Candy's mom. I thought it sounded a bit like Officer Mac. Um, but that is quite literally the only problem I had with the narration. He just perfectly captured the nuance and the emotion of the story it he took what was already haunting and dark and dreary <laughs> and made it more more haunting and and dreary um he, he did an exceptional job you're going to feel a volley of emotions you're going to be ping-ponged just around like crazy but again it's done right it's done well Definitely a five out of five. So, Bay's End by Edward Lorne uh, is my pick. And uh, I hope you check this book out. Um, it's on Audible, obviously. Um, and Amazon and wherever other books are sold. Um, until next time. Peace. You begin the process you outlined in your book to help yourself figure out a more scientific, practical approach to finding love. So how did it go from that to a published book? Oh, was, you know what they say, there's there's what you think you're gonna do and then there's what really happens. Um, yeah. I actually did not set out ever to publish a book. All I wanted to do was solve my own problems and I only wanted to do it for myself. And then after I'd done that, uh, Somebody who was a friend of a friend of a friend many states away asked me if I would help her. 
And I said, oh, you know, I'm a new professor at Cal State Fullerton. I, I really don't have the time to do that. And she said, well, I'll pay you a lot of money. And I said, oh, look, my calendar just opened up. <laughs> so uh, I, I started a consulting business on accident and that took off. And then over the years, um, after it, I wound up divorced actually. And then I was a single mom for a while. And when I met my husband and we're coming up on 10 years, happily married now. Congratulations. Um, thank you. Uh, when I met Vic, it was a running joke with all my friends, with really anybody who knew me, that the next words Duena will say will be, you know, there's a study that says, or, well, you know, research finds, or isn't it interesting? Because in science, we know. And so Vic said, you know, all this stuff about dating and picking the right partner and getting over heartache. And he said, you know, it's great. And, and I don't know anyone who knows it but you. And I said, well, you know, actually a lot of people know at least part of it. The scientists who conduct the research know it. And he said, yeah, but are they writing these books? And I said, no, they're not. And he said, well, you should write a book. And at the time, I guess my daughter was six and I really felt like I didn't want to go to work during the day and spend all, I mean, I had a kid because I wanted a kid, not because I wanted an heir or something. So um, basically I put off doing anything about this. And then my husband said, when she was about seven, he said, okay, if not a book, why don't you just do a blog? You seem to have a real need to talk about this. People want to hear about it, I think, just his opinion. Why don't you just do a blog? And one day I was lecturing to my students about things people regret. And I realized that the thing I was going to regret if I died young would be that I never wrote the book. Wow. And so uh, I started with the blog and then just to get things going and then eventually it reached kind of a critical mass and I started getting demands for a book. First it was requests and then I had this one <laughs> fan who's thanked in the book, her name is Holly Russo and uh, now Holly Russo Mori. And uh, she used the book to find her delightful mate and she started sending me my articles in order and said, well, what if I put it together as a book for you? Like she was gonna do this book whether I was gonna do the book or not so I thought, okay, it's. <laughs> It's really time. And initially I thought I would get a big publishing house and then I did research into it and was like, no, I don't think so. With subject matter like this, where it's relatable material, how much of what you went through made it into the final cut of the book and how much is it just facts and figures? Did you, do you, were you careful to kind of uh, make sure that you had some stories that were relatable that you know, it wasn't just a fact and figure book? Nobody wants to read facts and figures. No. <laughs> if they did, then the best sellers out there would be academic journals. <laughs> Literally, un unless you are a professional bean counter, nobody wants to read your facts and figures. Nobody. Yeah. So you even have a hard time within organizations that are fact and figure based, getting those people to read facts and figures. For example, there was a study on, you see, I'm already doing it. <laughs> there was a study on how many people read scientific journal articles. Mm. In, the, in the social sciences. And it turned out that most articles published in social science are read by the person who wrote it, whoever collaborated with them, and the reviewers. And that's it. Most of them were read by five to six people. And that's giving them a little more readership than they probably really got. Right. So I knew, so I read science so you don't have to. <laughs> that's that's basically what I do. I knew that the human brain evolved with stories. What we told each other around campfires were stories and what made a lasting impression on the people that we raised our humanity with was stories. People didn't have statistics until very recently. So trying to approach people with stats doesn't work. And I'll be darned if I'm going to write a book that doesn't work. So what I did is I did not write a science book. I also didn't write what else is out there, which is just advice books. I've got to tell you, it's a peeve of mine when people write advice books and two peeves. They, they write an advice book, but then throughout the book, they say that they don't give advice. What is up with that? 
There, I'm thinking of two really prominent authors right now who write nothing but advice books, and they'll tell you several times in the book, well, you know, I'm not giving you advice or anything. Yes, you are. You're giving me advice, yeah, right. so I'm honest about it. This is an advice book. This is a self-improvement, self-help, relationship help book. The differentiator is it's based on science instead of being based on my dating experience. That said, I have stories about my dating and relational experience in there, but I have a lot of other people's stories, too, and they're true stories. Nice. What is this exhausting research process like? Because I, I gotta imagine it's exhausting because that's what you base it on is science. Uh, but I mean, obviously, it's 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 exhilarating for you because that's what you like. But it, it had you had to run into some brick walls and sometimes as well. So what is how do you approach it? Are you someone who gathers all the facts and figures first and then tries to weave that into a story? Are you someone who's weaving a story and then goes and researches it as you're as you're telling the story? How did you approach that process? It's really interesting. I think if I had started out to write a book, I would have approached it much differently. But keep in mind, I started out to help myself. Right. And because I wasn't starting out to write a book, instead of having a preconception about what the narrative would be and making things fit into that preconception and cherry picking what already fit with what I wanted, I read everything that I could. Nice. And I based my my plan off of having read exhaustively and thoroughly, I didn't base it off, I'm just, I have an ax to grind and I'm going to uh, make the narrative fit that. So people have asked me how long it, take, it took me to write the book. It either took me 70 days or 15 years, depending on how you count it. <laughs> I'm just curious, did you, did you have to stop yourself sometimes and go back and refresh your brain? And, and I mean, obviously, if you're over a period of 15 years, you don't retain everything that, it, that you've, you've studied. So, but uh, you had probably some good recall, but was, was there times when you had to do that in terms of the research process? Sure, but I only did it at the end of the book. So oh, there you go. first of all, I learned everything for myself. And then years later, I had that blog. And the blog became read in over 30 countries. And uh, the blog was not based on topics that I pre-selected. It was based on questions people would send me. They would send me a question and I would go and find okay. what science considered to be the answer. And instead of, you know, giving them facts and figures, I would give them stories and I would make it in a really relatable format. Kind of like it wasn't any harder to read than Dear Abby, but it was as if Dear Abby actually had scientific basis for what she was yeah. saying. And so, <laughs> you know, I don't want, I don't, I don't buy the general consensus that science has to be hard to read. I think it should be very easy to read. Um, recently, there was an ad campaign around my book, and people who were, you know, trying to pick which campaign was going to happen were, you know, should we go with a fun, easy read that lets science be your guide? Because it is fun and it's easy. Or should we go mm -hmm. with um, Blends Heart, Soul, and Science? So you find and keep the one. And, you know, people like the second one better, but they both capture the truth of the matter, which is you want to make what you write really, really easy and relatable. You don't want to talk down to your audience, but you definitely want to speak. There, you know what? People who are looking for love, people who are looking for advice, they already have jobs. Yeah. And, and making it easy for them to read what you write is not – condescending it's acknowledging that you they're giving you something really valuable when they read what you say they're giving you their time and their attention they're giving you for your book between 10 and 20 hours of their attention that's a lot of attention and so if they're going to do that it needs to be really rewarding for them to read it needs to be really hopeful your advice needs to be couched in terms that people feel like you know what i can do this what, what was the most interesting thing you found in doing your research that maybe even surprised you uh, probably the most surprising thing I found again and again and again and again was that men are more emotional than women. <laughs> it really surprised me. You know, initially, the other more, most surprising thing I found was that a third to a half of my readers and my actually 80% of my clients are men. So, you know, with the relationship advice sphere, my sphere, usually the readership is almost exclusively female. And when I started to write the book, I initially, even though the blog had always been written to anyone who approached and a third to a half of those readers were guys, I assumed that that was specific to the blog. The blog format is really quite different from the book format because I only gave myself a thousand words a week, hmm. whereas, you know, the book is 70,000 words or more. Right. So, um, 
so I can explore topics in greater depth and have more stories in the book. And I just thought, you know, guys, I don't know if they're going to connect because there are a lot more stories in the book. Well, it turns out guys really, really like the book. And, and I was trying to figure out why. And what surprised me was men are more emotional than women and men value love as much as women do. And they want their relationships to work just like women do. And they are willing to invest money and energy and attention in making their relationships work, but they want it to be from a standpoint of fact. They do not want to hear just yet another person's opinion who says, well, I have feminine, I have female parts, so here's the advice, guys, or I <laughs> had terrible dating experiences, and here's what I learned. They don't want that. They want no. the stories, but they want to know that it's based on the stats. Um, <laughs> what do you like about being indie? Oh my gosh, you know, it's so funny. I learned so much over the course of the summer. So I told you, I just turned down this big publishing contract from right. Hachette. Yeah. And I had been told, even before self-publishing, there were a couple publicists who had worked with, you know, Alan Alda and, and lots and lots of really kind of A-list famous people who had said, uh, you could get this published through a legit publishing house. Why are you creating your own label? Which my label is Love Science Media. Why are you creating your own label and putting it out yourself? And I gave a list of about 15 reasons and said, tell me I'm wrong. And these people all came back and said, you know, again, these are people in the industry. They all came back and said, well, you're not wrong, but you'd probably sell more copies if you went with a publishing house. Then, out of the blue, an agent approached me last March and said, oh my God, I love your book. I'm using it in my own life. And I noticed that, you know, I looked up your publisher and I noticed that you own the label. And I think we could get this in front of, you know, the biggest names out there. And she did a good job of getting it in front of the biggest names out there. Um, we got 99% of the way to an, uh, to an offer with Penguin. Uh -huh. And the only reason they backed out was I wouldn't sell the world rights. Mm. I already owned them and was selling them. I wasn't going to part with that. So they backed out. And then Hachette, uh, their division, Perseus, and the division of running press, they really wanted the book. And so they said, okay, you can keep your foreign rights. That's, that's fine. And they made a couple other concessions. Even though I didn't sign, and even though this was like a half a year pro process, during which, at the end, I refused to sign. I think they could not believe I didn't sign. I'm still so glad I didn't. I learned so much about what I don't like about the English language publishing process. Let me tell you, keep your foreign rights people because there's nothing easier than selling foreign rights. It is so easy. You get an agent, you send, you send some copy out, they ask for you to distribute books to places that are interested. You don't have to change anything. It's easy. That's not the way it works here. You touched upon this, that you consider it a self-help book. There's a certain stigma that goes along with, with being labeled self-help. Did you ever worry about that? Do you consider, uh, you obviously don't consider it a bad word. So do you? No, but I, I've noticed the stigma, Joe, because mm -hmm. you'll notice that it's self-help is being relabeled self-improvement. Right, sure. To kind of get away from the stigma, and I imagine self-improvement will eventually be stigmatized. Here's the thing. People who are reading my book, I'm making an assumption which has largely been borne out by the daily letters I receive from readers. Mm. And that assumption is you're hurting and you have become willing to humble yourself and seek a new approach. So a little thing like the title, uh, the label of self-help or self-improvement is not gonna stop you at that point. Look, I have been there. I was the person standing in a Barnes and Noble looking for a book just like the one I have written. I ultimately wrote this book because it, I don't know what I would have paid to have this information. If somebody had distilled all this for me and I hadn't had to read every study under the sun in order to do this, I, I don't know what I would have given for that. But I went to a Barnes and Noble and looked for it and it wasn't there. And now it is. Twenty four years. I uh, that's an amazing, amazing accomplishment. And all the folks at Slam Dance, I wanna thank you personally for being so gracious, for allowing me to be a part of this incredible, credible event and celebration. It's been a dream of mine. And I never thought when I started this channel that that be the direction I had. 
that I would have these opportunities to to go ahead and cover something so prestigious and awesome as the Slam Dance Film Festival, but I'm really excited that I did get that opportunity, and I can't I can't wait to do it again. Hopefully, they'll have me back, and we'll get you even more great stuff uh, from up and coming artists. The artists that we interviewed were fantastic. Their films are fantastic. I hope you guys all go and follow them on social media and look out for when their films come around towards you, maybe at a film festival near you or a screening near you or even online at some point. You might be able to see uh, once they get distribution, the films in their entirety and I would love for you all to let me know when you do get the chance to see the film what you thought of each of these filmmakers visions now we have an incredible 25th episode coming up for you next month I don't want to get into spoilers but most of you who follow us know one of at least the guests that we will have on our next guest interviews that we will have on our next show and it's going to be an amazing amazing show so i hope you all do come back subscribe if you haven't already and like and comment on this video as well we have our third season of coffee break going on right now if you haven't checked that out please do so Uh, we have the other two seasons up on our channel as well we have indie insights with Marty Kate up, and she's got a new show coming up pretty soon. So definitely go check that out. And check out all our live panels. We do a live panel every month where we talk to indie artists about indie issues. And if you haven't yet and you want to be a part of our think tank, we have a Facebook group called Go Indie Now's Think Tank and a Suggestion Box. Please go and join. I have one rule in that I never add anybody who doesn't ask me to be added. So you'll never be added to our group unless you personally join or you message me and tell me you want to be added. So if that's the case, I will add you, but otherwise I'll never do that. So don't assume that you're part of our group because it's not its not the Go Indie Now Facebook page. It's a totally separate group. And that, that's where we set up all of the content for our shows. So uh, we have... Uh, polls that we vote on and we have great discussions going on there so definitely go check that out and become a part of our group if you're not already all right that's almost all of our show we have an incredible short film from sharon lee like i spoke of in the beginning she's an awesome awesome filmmaker she had an incredibly awesome film that she she had at slam dance so i thought it was uh very apropos to have a slam dance filmmaker uh, showcasing a film on our on our episode, and she was so gracious enough to let us showcase one of her o- earlier works, which is phenomenal. So definitely stick around for that right after me. We'll see you next episode. Thank you so much for joining us, and remember, it's always time to go any now. All right, everybody, we'll see you soon. Hi, everyone. My name is Sharon Lee, and I'm the director of... Um, of The Key, which is a short that I made in 2012, which is a film that you are about to see. And um, I actually made this film as part of a series of three short films called Three Short Shorts. Um, The first one is The Key, the second one is A Bad Fall, uh, sorry, the second one is Which Way to Happiness, and the last one is A Bad Fall. And I wanted to take these expressions that we have, like The Key to Success and the way to happiness and falling in love and t- kind of take them s- literally. Um, I made these shorts quickly, I wrote the scripts quickly and um, r- wanted to direct, shoot, edit them myself just as an exercise to see what I could do on a short timeline um, without thinking about it too much. So I never really plan for these shorts to be out there in the world and seen by too many people but I'm so uh, glad that Joe found this film and wanted to share them with you so I really hope you enjoy it. Thanks.
Steve? So. So yeah. Wait, Kyle. What? How did you know which key to choose? I just do. I just know this is the right one. It's gotta be. How do you know? Listen, you've just gotta try a whole bunch. I did. Can you help me? This one's no good. This one's no good. This one sucks. No matter what anyone tells you. But this one? This one almost worked. Try it. You just said it doesn't work. No, I said it almost worked. Which means it doesn't work. It might work for you. You know where to find it. Changed my mind. Now, as, as artists, we're the most critical, you know, of our own work. And we watch it on screen, and the big screen tends to expose a lot of things. And things you think about and go, God damn, I wish I'd done that or done this, or wish this had cut a little bit stronger. Um, but I want to know from each of you, what did you think you nailed? Not what you thought was bad, but what you thought was like really, oh, uh, I got that. Cool question. Mine's easy, it's the team. <sighs> Nice. Oh, partner. Um, uh, probably my greatest, uh, I mean, I have two things that I felt the best on the scene, and that was one was uh, Palmer killing people with number two pencils. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when, I when I discovered that in the writing room, I was just like, this ain't changing. Like, <laughs> you know? And I love that he explains it. That's yeah. the best thing about it, you know? <laughs> I, I, felt, I, felt really, I felt, I was feeling myself a little bit about that one. Yeah. And then there's one line at the very end where they ask, and they're like in class, and it was like, you know, just the reaction to that line. I was like, I guess I did know that. I, that one. <laughs> uh, I think for me, my my favorite parts that I feel like I nailed uh, are my two smiles that I have, in nice. the film, which are very much the encapsulation. Yeah, for smile. you, it's all about the look. Yeah, yeah totally. Yeah. It is absolutely all about the look. So also just losing the 25 pounds I lost and growing my hair out and transforming as much as I could into a different looking character. But yeah, I just I feel like I have to help you out here because it sounds, because you're too humble, but like what he nailed was the character itself. He lost mm. so much weight and he got into this role like, you know, like we were a little bit out of college and like, you know, there was a mention of like, will he fit a college kid? Heston took that by storm. Heston was just like, fuck no. <laughs> he was just like, like, no way, I got this. And like he, we actually had original concept art, uh, like I sent it to, we had original concept art for the character, like of course it's very skinny, you know, freshman, mm -hmm. you know what I mean, and, and like we're well out of college. And, and Hessen took this, he put it as a background of his phone, he looked at it every day, he's like, I'm going to become this character, or I will die trying. <laughs> nice. And that is what it is, and like, and I, I, he had the eye of the tiger, you know, like, we were there for Rocket 3. <laughs> yeah. I go, you know, you always heard about the, you know, the eye of the tiger, and we would talk about it, but like, when I looked into Hessen's eyes, I swear to you, if you ever want to know what it is, I'll find a picture of it. That, that was the eye of the tiger. Nice. Uh, he nailed that. He nailed that. <laughs> Thank you, Drew. But yeah, no, it's, it's the smiles. Those are my spike moments. Nice. Um, I liked, um, I wanted to make sure, I, I studied a lot of vaudeville. Yeah. And um, clowning and stuff like that. So I, I wanted to make, movement's always very, very important to me. 
And um, I wanted to bring that Western vibe to him. Mm. And I feel like there's certain scenes where I want, like there's one scene where I walk up and I do the John Wayne walk. Mm. And it's just, just where it's not pushed, but it looks good. Um, I, think, I think just the Western, that classic, what, what, you know, I remember when we did this, I looked at the script and said, it's a very interesting script. <laughs> and he said, well, I want to shoot it like a spaghetti western. I said, I'm in. You know what I mean? like, yeah, yeah. Because it just, it, it, it was cool. But I think um, the soul of what that was, I really wanted to achieve. Yeah. I'm going to pat your back a little bit here and tell you.